All right, friends, we officially have a monthly lecture, but it doesn't really always happen. Uh, and But as we're coming close to Nativity, uh, the Nativity Lent and beginning our weekly schedule during Nativity Lent, just as we do during the Great Lent, uh, Father Colin and I thought it would be a, a very good idea to have uh, a lecture about uh, death and dying and how to prepare ourselves. So next month, the lecture will be about Christian anthropology. Should be very interesting. Um, but today, we will talk about death and dying. Yes, John? Did we already have the Christian anthropology? We had one cut at that. I think Father Vladimir did something similar to that, um, and we'll, we'll. I think we're going to take another another go uh, and and look at it more from like the contemporary social movements as opposed to historically. Okay, so the talk has a couple of. It has about four parts. So I'll take a pause at the end of each of them and ask for questions, and then we can have questions at the end also. Um, what we're passing out is information about our cemetery, uh, because everybody needs to have this information, right? I, I understand that uh, we sometimes forget that denial is not just a river in Egypt. Thank you. Uh, and we, we think that we are, are going to live forever, and that's true. If we live according to the gospel in this life, we will live forever, but not on this earth. Uh, we are just pilgrims here visiting, uh, and this is an important piece. So let's begin. What to do when someone gets very sick? Perhaps the sickness will be unto death, and perhaps not. But the biggest mistake that we find is that people wait too long to call the priest to say, you know, I have cancer, or I have a heart problem, or I have this, or I have that. It's really important to call immediately. Oh, sorry, did I say that in Russian? It's probably good that I did, because that's the noisiest table in the corner. So we'll, we'll ask. But all I got is Russian and English. So if you want it in like Swahili or something, we're going to have to do interpretive dance. All right, let's get back to the, uh, to, to, to the conversation. The biggest mistake is that people wait too long to call the priest to let them know, let him know that they're sick. Even if you think, you wish, you believe, you're in complete delusion that you're going to get better. It doesn't help me or Father Colin at all, right? I still think that he probably can read minds, but I can't. So, at least for me, you can't expect that I'm going to find this out by you thinking about it. Or that somehow I'll get a call from the doctor. It's not going to happen. You need to let us know when you're sick so we can begin to help you. Whether you're going to get better or not... And nobody knows, like, who's promised tomorrow? None of us. So it's a very important that you let us know when you're not doing well. We need the prayers of the church when we get sick, and we might need even more than that. The sacraments that could be, should be administered while someone is cogent, since they are not magical spells. The person receives God's grace in the sacraments as a participant, not as a passive receiver of grace. So how many times I've been called to the bedside of someone who's like three and a half breaths away from death and the family is like, well, let's have confession. Let's have communion. I'm like, it's going to die in like two minutes. It's way too late. You needed to call me two months ago. So this is a recurring theme. I'll probably say that a hundred times because if we're anything as humans, we are consistent. We are consistent. So this happens like 98% of the time. Oh yeah, my grandma's been sick with bad cancer you know, for, for six months. So come on over now. Okay, that's good to at least call us before someone dies. But we're not there to just preside over the death. The church is there to help someone to have a good death, to have someone prepare themselves correctly so that they may pass into that next life with joy. Confession and communion are a must. Unction might be served as well. And it gives us the opportunity by saying that lovely word, unction, uh, to talk about the fact that this is not last rites. Somehow living in the West, we, we got the, because the Catholic Church calls this last rites, that we, we sort of do that as the person is taking their last couple of breaths. That's not true at all. Unction helps us to prepare God's blessing, to, to accept God's blessings, 
because he only sends good. But we need help sometimes to understand that what he's sending us is good. The Lord knows best when we need to leave this life. Since the goal of this life is salvation, the Lord will take us when we are at our highest spiritual point. Now, about half the room just thought, okay, I'm going to start sinning a lot. A lot, because I don't want God to take me, so I'm not going to get to that highest spiritual point. It doesn't work that way. Sorry. If that's the truth, then today is your highest spiritual point, so you better drive home carefully. Uh, So we are striving to be transformed, to be transfigured into the sons and daughters of God. And and when we get to the highest point we're going to get, that's when we step into the next life. Questions about this part? John. Um, is the unction going to be the kind of a seven priest, or is it going to be like a, a smaller? So the question is, would unction be with seven priests? So we would try to arrange that if we can, but that is best done in the church. So earlier on in someone's course of their disease, rather than when they're already bedridden, just works out better that way. In any case, we'll gather as many priests as we can to serve unction. Right now we have three priests in the parish, thank God. So if someone needed to have unction at home, we would do that with three priests. Um, It doesn't have to be with seven. And there is a short order of unction that can be served uh, in the hospital also. And I assure you that that short order of unction is just for the relatives who don't want to listen to seven gospels and seven prayers. It's not for the person. Uh, But we have to kind of make a pastoral call there because you'll see later on how much we need to rely on the family. As we uh, as we go through this process of death and dying, um, so we have we do have some options. We would try to do it with as many priests as possible. What have other questions, John? Yes. So if you are doing an unction and more than seven priests show up, do you have to tell somebody to stand down? There's like a spiritual penalty box, and uh, no, the it it does happen occasionally. Mostly when we have general unction in the parish. We might have more than seven priests. I've never seen that happen at the hospital. I've never seen seven priests gather at the hospital. It's usually one or two or three. Um, but in the parish, it could happen. Uh, and when we have the general unction during Great Lent, then usually we have those extra priests hear confessions during the during the unction. But if it was for someone in the hospital, then they'd just help us with the readings and so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. Question? Did you bring that you said about it being, or maybe explain just a little more about being at your highest? Right. So when we would leave this life, the Lord created us to share his love with us. He wants us to be as close to him as possible. So as we are striving in this life to be transformed into the sons and daughters of God, when we reach that height from which we will only begin to go down, that's the time when God takes us. That's the understanding of the church. Now, that doesn't always make sense to us in the world because sometimes that's When someone is very old and they've, you know, they're suffering in their bed and so on and so forth, it means that somehow that's all part of the process to get them to that highest point. So sometimes people leave this life early, sometimes they leave this life late. It's all according to God's wisdom. And when we reach the point in this life, when we will be closest to Him in the next life. Does that make sense? Because we're not living for this life, we're pilgrims here. We only know this life, so of course we're pretty attached to it. But we are just pilgrims in this life, preparing ourselves for the next life. So it makes sense if you think about it that the Lord would take us when we get as close to him as possible because he wants us to be as close to him as possible in the next life. We would not know. There are very few saints. We read about this in the lives of the saints that they are, let, they are told about their uh, impending death. It's very rare, even among the saints. I, I would say a handful. You, you hear about that, but you do. And occasionally the Lord will send one back also. Uh, you know, someone will die and then they'll, they'll come back to life. But that's, that's always with the message. And the message is usually, we need to start getting serious about repentance. That's usually the message. Good question. I think Euphemia had her hand up. Uh, oh, I can't see you, but you can speak in. I, I, um, I heard that people who die in like in unrepentant state, then they will have often like a violent death because that's kind of like God's way of like of uh, uh, for lack of better word like uh, purging them of their sins. 
like the four day drive? Is that um, something you've heard or heard So I'll repeat just so people can hear. Um, the question was, uh, do those who are, have not reached a state of repentance die a more violent or long death so that they can get to that point? I wouldn't say that the church has that understanding, like universally. I could see how the Lord might do that. But again, his wisdom is beyond our kind of meager understanding. So like we don't have a concept of purgatory, for instance, in the Orthodox Church, right? We don't have this idea that people will go and sort of be tortured in the flames for a while so they can be purified and then go to the heaven the kingdom. It just doesn't exist. That's, a, that's something that's relatively new even in the Catholic Church. So we, we don't have that. So, um, yeah, I don't say that, you know, the Lord can't do that because he doesn't take his orders from me. But um, that's not kind of a, we wouldn't say, okay, that person had a violent death. Therefore, it means that this was the case. Not necessarily. The Lord knows the best way for us to go also. And, and he'll give that to us. Henri? Many martyrs have violent deaths that's a good point. That's a very good. So Henri mentioned that the martyrs uh, mostly died a very violent death also. Yeah. And we sort of looked at them as the examples. So I'm not saying that no saint ever wrote that, Euphemia, or that that's, nobody has that idea. But I wouldn't say it's universal in the church. <laughs> Paula? I mean, that's, uh, that's very Catholic, I think. Because I remember my mom, when I, one day I said, oh my God, mom, this man is not sleeping and he's dying. And he didn't sleep for two weeks as I was taking care of him. And she said, well, I guess he did his purgatory. I was like, okay, but... Right, it's, a, it's just a it's, different concept. And I think yeah. for us who grow up in the church or have been in the church for a long time, um, we don't get, we don't understand that in the West, in order to understand things theologically, you need to use logic and dialectical proofs and philosophy we don't have that in the east I mean, we just I would have 50 years of purgatory 50 years of purgatory yeah i think a lot of people would, would wait for that um, <laughs> at least we but thankfully you're orthodox now and you don't have to worry about that uh but so we don't have that we're just kind of like well that's what it is that's how it is the wine and bread become the body and blood of christ we don't know exactly how that happens. Like we're gonna, we don't have a, that down to a molecular thing. We just know that that's the case, and we trust and believe, and that's it. So th there are reasons for this. Like in the East, we never had a Reformation or a Counter Reformation. Scholasticism wasn't very strong in the East, so we just kind of kept doing what we did yesterday. Um, whereas in the West, they had all these competing things going on. Okay, let's get back to the lecture, if you don't mind, and we'll there'll be time for more questions later. Um, what happens when someone dies? Ideally, the person has been well prepared by the sacraments, discussions with the priest, and their own spiritual efforts to prepare for the journey into eternal life. It is possible the priest will be present at death, but this does not always happen. If so, the priest will read the prayers for the separation of the soul from the body before death. There are then specific prayers read after someone reposes as well. These could be read afar, from afar if need be, but it's better to do it in person if at all possible. In our North American practice, the body is then generally taken to the funeral home to be prepared. It's entirely possible for us to do this ourselves as well, but this is not the culture that we live in in our days. Uh, this was the ancient practice, of course, and old believers still follow this practice. If you ever get to go to the church in Erie, Pennsylvania, they have a special space there uh, where they prepare people for, for their funerals and dress them and so on and so forth. So um, we could do that too, but that's not generally the way that it works. The understanding of death in the Orthodox Church is simply the separation of the soul from the body. The body cannot live without the soul. Since the body uh, and the soul were created together, the soul usually stays near the body until the third day when it begins its journey towards heaven accompanied by its guardian angel. This is why we have the funeral as a rule on the third day. The soul could hypothetically go wherever it wants to during these three days. It is free from the body. But it seems that most of the time the soul stays near the body based on the accounts of the lives of the saints. The lives of the saints are a crucial part of the big T tradition of the church. St. John of San Francisco almost always used examples of the lives of the saints 
to teach moral and theological lessons. Questions about this little part? Okay, so we'll keep going. And I'll ask Ephemia to come in. Oh, yes. Uh, our angels will do something uh, when we die that will something help us to go up to the heaven or so the question is, will, will our guardian angel help us after we have died? So the first and most important part of this answer is that our guardian angel is helping us now. And we should be asking the guardian angel's help. This is very important. Each one of us at our baptism is given a guardian angel. They are way underutilized in our days. We need to ask their help more often. Of course, angels are not God. But they work for him. They are also close to him. And so we would ask the angel, just as we would ask one of the saints, to pray to God for us. But it's okay if we will say something to our guardian angel, like, you know, please help me, this is a tough spot I'm in, so on and so forth. Do the angels help us after our death? Our understanding is they accompany us into the next life, uh, and that they will bring us, uh, as we proceed towards the heavenly kingdom, to the Lord. And then they will be with us when we are shown all the beautiful things of heaven and shown all the terrible things of hell. We don't experience those things. We're just shown them as a confirmation of our faith. Uh, and then the guardian angel will bring us back to the Lord on the 40th day after our death, at least according to the world. This could happen in an instant in the next life. We don't know because there's no sun. There's no days and nights. There's no so, But that's how we understand it in, in worldly terms. And then at that point, we don't know what happens to them. Maybe they get reassigned. Not sure. But anyway, so yes, they're they are helping us. But we sort of really meet them on that day that we die. We know that we got them when we were baptized, uh, but we don't see them. So we really meet them on that day. John, question. Um, okay, so the guardian angel and the, your, the saint, uh -huh. not the same thing? Uh, good question. So John asks, is your guardian angel and your patron saint the same thing? The answer is no. You might have a patron saint who is an angel. Well, then you got you, you got double riches, right? Uh, but no, when you're baptized or when you're joined to the church, if it's by uh, chrismation or some uh, other way, uh, you're appointed a guardian angel. And each person is appointed this guardian angel. Um, your saint is different. You, are also, you also have a patron saint, but the patron saint will not be with you through this life. Uh, the patron saint is, is doing their work in the heavenly kingdom. Yes, John. So why do they say, when it's your name's day, gain angela, as if, like, the, what, the, the saint doesn't matter anymore? And it's just no, it's the, it, that's actually the day of your saint. Uh, I don't know why. I don't know why. I don't know why that's the case. It's a saint. 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 Okay, that's a good question. Good discussion. Well, the folk can be Christian. They, they are mostly, yes. Other questions about this part? All right, we'll move on to the third of four parts. So we've, we've made the halfway point. If you survived. The funeral. The body is brought to the church after it is prepared in the funeral home or at home. This is practically almost always the day after the person dies. The body is brought into the church accompanied by the singing of Holy God, with the priest proceeding with incense and holding a cross. The divine services are held as usual in the temple, vespers and matins in the evening, followed by the reading of the Psalter over the reposed all through the night by volunteers. Divine liturgy is served in the morning, and generally the funeral is held immediately after the end of the divine liturgy. Sometimes there's a little pause there, uh, if, especially if the clergy have traveled from afar away. We'll give them a cup of coffee or something before we start. But generally it goes divine liturgy, funeral, burial. The funeral service follows the general form of matins. So that means there's readings from the Psalter. In a parish, these kathisma are usually abbreviated. They're not omitted, but they're abbreviated. There's a beautiful canon for the reposed, which honestly is more for those who are standing than the one who is lying down. After that, poignant, after that the poignant verses are read or sung, followed by the epistle, gospel, and the last kiss with more verses. I'm going to win. I have amplification. 
So we, we can just keep ramping it up, or we can try to help the little ones be, be quiet, but I, I, I'll win this one. Um, following the last kiss, the body is covered with a winding sheet, just as Christ was, and the coffin is closed. It will not be opened again until the Lord returns. In the ideal situation, which is burial here at St. Vladimir's, the lantern, cross, and banners are precede, uh, precede the coffin to the cemetery, where the grave has already been prepared. There's a litia for the reposed at the grave, after which the coffin is lowered into the grave, and the faithful begin the burial. In our days, this is accomplished by sprinkling just a bit of dirt onto the coffin by each person, but I've also seen where the whole family pitches in and fills the whole grave. So it, it, it's just how whatever the family decides that they want to do, that's how we work it out. A memorial service is usually held after the burial. This actually harkens back to the most ancient Christian practice of the reposed leaving funds for a meal after their repose for the poor and asking the poor for their prayers. Okay, so that's the funeral part. Any questions about that? John? So how, how often have you noticed family members with shovels? Uh, Just a couple of times, I would say, in my 30 years. Do you think it has, has any relation to what the family's uh, uh, attitude was about them? You mean that they want to hasten them to, to be buried? Uh, actually, probably the opposite. The few times I saw it, I think the people were especially close to the repost. Um, but yeah, usually in our days, there's a truck standing by with uh, full of dirt, which came out from the grave, and it, the truck puts most of the dirt back in, but we at least begin the burial. But you'd allow that in, at St. Vladimir's? If people want to bury, sure. No unburying, but burying, yes. Definitely. So can I put that in, in the writing, like I want my husband? <laughs> Does it mean he's gonna do it? It doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't mean you're leaving first either. So, but we'll, we can work all that out. Other questions? Yeah, yes. My question is about the psalter. Milo. So the question is, I, I remember that we read this altar when Father Paul died, uh, and also when Milo died. And so what's what's the difference? Like, for some people we do and some people we don't. It's whether we can get enough volunteers to do it. It's a strictly practical question. It's a strictly practical question. What we did in Jordanville... Uh, is the seminarians would get a little uh, gift for doing that. I don't remember what it was, $5, $10, something like that. And so we would sign up, and everything was read, read through the night. And the family would give that money so that that would be done. Uh, we've done it with volunteers here, and I'm more than willing to do it with, with anyone. But uh, it's not always easy to get enough volunteers. Sure, if people wanted to do that, we could try to uh, entice entice folks. I mean, in the end, it's going to be probably mostly the, the young folks that, that are zealous. Although, you know, when 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 Milo died, uh, a couple of his godchildren did a lot of the reading in the in the wee hours. But if you think about it, when the cursed icon comes, we have no problem filling the whole night. So it's the same. It's the same kind of vigil. It's the same idea, John. You um. You said this happens in the church. Is there any precedent for doing it in the house? The reading part I've only seen done in the church, and I've only read about it being done in the church. But it's, it may be all believers might do that. They might start reading the second that they've got the person that, uh, um, dressed for the funeral. So I could see that happening, but I've, I've only seen it done in the church. Good questions. So people can eat uh, salty at home, right? They could. Um, it's perfectly fine and even good, I would say. But if we can manage to do it in the church, there's something about being in the church at 3 o'clock in the morning uh, with a couple of other people and reading for the repose. It's, it's really beautiful. But yes, we could do it at home. Other questions? Uh, you go. Uh, when I will die, I will... Start my path to heaven. <laughs> <laughs> I think you you've already started the path, but when you'll finish your path, yes, yes. Yeah, after the, I will die. Yeah, I agree. I will know how 
there was a ladder, like with Astra. Yes, the idea of the toll houses. Yes, this is kind of about asking what happened in my life by bills. And did I pass it or not? And I don't see the way that I will go to that up. So when I fell down, I don't know, is there any experience? I will be in communication with devils. Is it possible that they will ask me, like, to help them, or to, to be a devil? Like, like you know, like, you have a grandkids. <laughs> you know, instead of me, you can be watching them. Then make some temptation for them, but it will be you, not them. Something like that. It's a good question. So, uh, first, uh, Igor mentioned about, with, with us, about, the, about the toll houses. <laughs> so there is this idea, uh, it's a symbolism, that we, and we find it in one of the lives of the saints from, I guess it must be the 6th century, it might be the 7th, doesn't really matter. In any case, there's this explanation of how she rises towards the heavenly kingdom and needs to ask, actually it might be later than that, doesn't matter, ha has to answer for the life that she lived uh, in here, in this life. Was she good? Was she bad? And there are sort of these points where she stops, which are like toll houses. We don't even really know what a toll house is in our days. Probably some people think it's a chocolate chip. But what it is, it, it, it used to be that you'd have to drive your car to Chicago, and then you'd stop, and you'd pay some money at the toll. Now you just drive through, and send, the governor just takes the money right from your you know, electronic uh, file. But you used to have to put the money in. That's what a toll house is. And people in the ancient world, of course, knew what that was, because many of the roads that were used were toll roads. People, it was a, it was a for-profit business. And so people were very familiar with what this idea of a toll house was. And so it was used in this explanation of how we have to answer uh, in the next life for the life that we lived here. The church doesn't believe that there are actually these 20 stops that you have to make or that you will be even uh, questioned uh, by, by demons. It's just, this was a symbol to help people to understand that we answer in the next life for the life that we lived here. And we should sin as little as possible and do good as much as possible because there were some transactions going on there between her sins and the good deeds that she did. Um, so this is the toll houses. A lot of times people will accuse us of like, you. this is a dogma of the church. It's not, it's just an, a way to explain that we answer in the next life for the life that we've lived here. So that's that part. Uh, and do we become demons? No, we don't. We don't, thank God. Uh, and because even if, the, nothing is final until the Lord comes again, nothing. So you could hypothetically receive your temporary judgment in the heavenly kingdom and end for eternity in hell, although it seems very unlikely that that would be the case, or start out in hell and end up in the heavenly kingdom. How could that be? Well, you can't pray an unrepentant sinner into, into heaven. Someone who rejects God, rejects God. But at the same time, the Lord understands that person's heart, so maybe we don't even know that. But a lot of times, you know, it's the church's practice and always has been from the Old Testament now. We're talking about Old Testament people, and we do this now to this day, and the people of God have always done this, to pray for their dead. Why? Because they're in the same church that we are. You wouldn't hesitate to pray for somebody that's sitting beside, well, you might not like that person, but hypothetically, you would pray for that person if they asked you. Well, we know that those who have gone on before us pray for us, and we in turn pray for them. Love is not broken by death, because those people are in the same church that we are. That's just the church triumphant. We're in the church militant. But we have always prayed for the dead because until Christ comes again, hypothetically, there could be some movement in the next life. We don't understand that. We just know that that's possible. So maybe somebody kind of managed to just not quite make it to the heavenly kingdom and uh, by doing good deeds in their name uh, and uh, otherwise praying for them, we, might, we, we can help them. So again, it's not up to us where the Lord puts someone in the next life, but some of our actions in this life could have repercussions on the on their lives in the next life and that's why we always 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 serve all of the memorial saturdays and services in our parish because to say that okay you died uh, you're not part of the parish anymore that doesn't make any sense theologically they they these people died but they're still part of the parish so we still have to care for them and that's why we do the <coughs> memorial services 
Um, and that's why we should do the mobile range services. John. So did you even plan to uh, discuss the Toll House cookies or did uh, Eager hijack your lecture with this semi-heretical agenda? The nice thing about giving a lecture like this and asking for questions is you just never know what's going to happen. Right, so I like this idea of getting up in the morning and not quite knowing how my day is going to go. I mean, I don't want it to be random, but you know, having um, uh, some some interesting questions, I think it's great. I, I think we have to be open to, to to those conversations. Yes, Jack. No, Juan. Sorry. Let me see if I did this later. Probably I did. Anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll answer that. So the question is, why is cremation not an orthodox thing? I know that it's later on. Okay, hold that, and we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll address it, and then if I don't address it well enough, just throw something at me. Juan's dad is a priest, so he's, he, he doesn't have to, you know, there's no, there's no putting on airs here. He can just call me out. Okay, any other questions of this part, funeral? Okay, then let's go on to the next piece. Where do we often go wrong? And I hate to tell you, we often do. The biggest issue I have found in 30 years as a priest is not talking to the priest enough about your plans before you die. <clears throat> this includes funeral planning, estate planning, all planning. People are very proud and think they know what will happen because they have imagined it that way. But this is never how it happens, and I mean never. If you don't plan it, it's not going to happen. By not planning well, and especially not being willing to take advice, things usually end up exactly how you did not want them. So first, we should know, how do we make sure that we get an Orthodox funeral? There is something, Michigan has very nice laws about this. We have something called a funeral proxy. So you can appoint someone to be in charge of your funeral to make sure that it's done exactly the way you want it. Um, if you don't have an Orthodox family, it's an absolutely a must. And if you do have an Orthodox family, which is just dysfunctional, which most of us do, this is also probably a pretty good idea. I've seen priests get cremated because the, their family went berserk, right? You don't know what's gonna happen. So you need to plan, and you need to plan in such a way that we're, we don't open the will six months later and be like, oh, bummer, guess they wanted it that way. We're not gonna dig them back up. So there are things that have to be done ahead of time if you want to make sure that you're going to have a proper orthodox funeral and a funeral proxy is one of those. Estate planning, you really need to have a trust. I'm sorry, it costs more than a will, but if you want your wishes followed with your estate, you need to have a trust. The will can be adjudicated, it can be, um, um, it can be challenged, but the trust is a trust and it's done. If you have hope, for anything to be done that is not in a will, expect that it will not flow as you planned, especially if you don't have an Orthodox family. I don't think that non-Orthodox people are less honest than Orthodox people. Perhaps they are more honest, but they don't care about the things that you care about. And they won't follow any instructions that they don't agree with unless they are bound to do that by law. That's the reality, whether we like it or not. So we can deny it, we can bemoan it, we can pretend it's not true, but I would say, Nine times out of 10, maybe 99 times out of 100, if you don't set it up the way you want it, it doesn't happen that way. And I don't make a big deal about it. I don't yell and scream and, you know, I mean, it is what it is. There's only certain things that the church can do after you're dead. And it's mostly what your family lets us do. Because unless you set up a funeral proxy, then it's the next of kin who make the decisions. So... You really have to think about this. You really have to think about this and not just think, but act. If you wanna make sure that everything is done in the right way, right? The priest who got cremated, I talked to him beforehand. I'm like, let's get this all written down. And oh no, my family will do it. I told them everything I want. Famous last words. You need to make sure that everything is clear, 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 and clear, and that you're absolutely sure that it's going to happen the way you want it. And if not, put it in a funeral proxy, and then it will. Questions about this part? Estate planning and funeral planning. That's what we're talking about now. John. Can I appoint you to be my proxy? You could. But you have a wife who's going to take care of you. She's already talked about shoveling dirt on your grave. So I think she has some pretty like uh, comprehensive plans. 
Uh, yeah, and she's already got people ready to help her too. So, um, but and I think that it, although it can be embarrassing on a, on one level to say, well, I chose somebody else to be my funeral proxy. Mostly, people are happy that they don't have to deal with that because it's hard. It's hard. You're grieving. You're trying to figure out all these things. You're like, oh, you asked for this, this, and this. I'm too tired. We're just doing this. That's how it happens. And it's not judging the other people, but you've got to make sure that things are clear. So if, if any, if, if anything, please, please take that to heart. Yes, Grisha. Yeah. So something, and we were talking a little about this in uh, Grace class. If you're going to mention this later, you can talk about it, but I personally am extremely uncomfortable the idea of being, uh, what's the word when they preserve your body? Embalmed. Embalmed, uh-huh. And additionally, I'm also very comfortable with the idea of being, um, uh, when they look at like, the, the, the police will go in and try to see if there's any reason that you guys like, on autopsy. Autopsy, uh-huh. So is there anything to do with our doctor because I believe that there's kind of the orthodox position on that um, to not have that happen to you if you die? Or So well, let's first talk about embalming. Um, most people think that you have to be embalmed. You don't. You don't. It's a, it's, it is something that we have to work out with the funeral home. The thing is, the funeral home doesn't want to have someone with an open casket if they don't look nice. That's just the way that we think about death. It's bad advertising for them. Right? So because we use funeral homes in, in our days, it's essentially a negotiation. Um, generally most funeral homes are willing to work with you on that if the person is uh, put into the cooler as soon as possible after they die. Um, we found that that usually works out just fine. But we also have a funeral home in town that understands about Orthodox Christianity, they understand about Orthodox funerals. This may be not true in, less, in, in a more rural area. Autopsies, you can volunteer to have uh, your body autopsied to train uh, the next generation of um, pathologists, right? Um, but there's not a rule that people are autopsied unless you die in certain ways. Um, so if you die in the hospital, and it's already clear that you were dying, then there's no autopsy is required. If you die in hospice care, there's no autopsy is, is required uh, because it's already understood that you're dying. But if there's any question outside of that, like you die at home unexpectedly, there will probably be an autopsy. And that's out of our control. That's, that's the state makes that decision uh, because they're trying to make sure that spouses are not killing each other off and so on and so forth. So um, that's very... What's, so that's it's that's out of our control. But embalming, um, this is kind of a negotiation that we do, I would say, with the funeral home. And this is just another really good reason to set up your funeral ahead of time so that your wishes are followed. And if you go to a place and they say, no, we only will embalm you, you say, okay, well, thank you, but I'm gonna, I'll am gonna, i find somebody else to, to take care of me. And I would say that in, in our days, probably, it used to be that every, almost everybody was embalmed, but it was just a different time. It mostly had to do with like who was the expert and who wasn't the expert. But after the pandemic, we don't really do experts much anymore. Um, so I would say that it's fewer people are embalmed now, but not none. I, I remember when we were in Jordanville, the Bishop of Los Angeles died. It's hot in Los Angeles. And they, uh, they had to pack him after he died in um, dry ice in the coffin. Uh, and flew him uh, to Jordanville for the burial. And I, I remember the, the burial, the funeral was done there. I remember the burial because, of course, we carried the, the coffin, and it was heavy. Uh, he was not a big man, but they must have put a lot of ice in there because it was, it was really heavy. Um, I, I don't think that that in our days would be, would be necessary. Generally, we're going to do the funeral here. So even if you're getting buried somewhere else, um, to come right from the funeral home. You wouldn't be able to do overnight probably in the, in the in the church if you did that. Although I would have no problem with it personally. Uh, we'd have to work that out with the funeral home. So it's just another way to say we need to do all this ahead of time so we know what, what's going on. But it's not, there is no law in Michigan that says you must be involved. John. Um, so is the open casket a requirement in Orthodoxy? I would say it's it's close to a requirement. Um, we do close caskets when um, 
when it's just impossible based on the kind of death that someone had to have an open <laughs> casket. Or like when the soldiers come from overseas, um, it usually, that doesn't happen real fast. And it's not, it's really not possible to, to do an open casket. So in those cases, um, what we often do is I will take the prayer of absolution and the, uh, the crown that we put on that says, Holy God, Holy Mighty, Holy Immortal, have mercy on us. I'll usually do that in the funeral home with the director or at some time before, usually sometimes after the funeral. Um, yeah. So that's, that's occasionally there's a closed casket and that's how we do that. And, but we still, people are, are cared for. It's just maybe not be quite as open. Uh, as it is during a funeral when the casket is, is open. Yes. So what's the difference in will and trust? Like one who involves... Uh, so a will is, it, it's your wishes and it is a legal document, but the trust essentially, um, by, by making a trust, it doesn't have to go through probate, it doesn't have to go through the, the court in the same way that a will does. Uh, and essentially it, it confirms whatever you're saying is it can't really be um, challenged. challenged. Yeah, it can't really be challenged. Yes, and it costs more. It costs more. And that's why I was stressing to people, do it. It costs more, but do it, do it. It really makes everybody's life easier. Um, how many times we had people that said, well, we want, to, we want to leave you this or we want to do that. And I'll say, put it in a will, put it in a trust. No, nope, it doesn't happen. They die. It doesn't happen. I'm not upset, but that's just the reality. It's that is an investment in making sure that your um, your wishes are fulfilled uh, regarding your estate. The funeral, I would go with the funeral proxy. That's 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 very powerful. Yes, Emma. Do you know what you can do in our parish? We don't have a lawyer in the parish right now. Um, sometimes when folks ask to uh, set up a trust, I'll send them to DMAC because it usually has to do with estate planning. And he has a lawyer who's a friend of his that we've worked with. So if you if you want to set up a trust, you can talk to Dima and he can direct you to his, his friend who's a lawyer who's, who's helped us out a few times. Jack. Okay, well, just to be clear, the Orthodox Church, they don't have a rule against embalming? Or... No. No, I would say that it's less traditional only in that it's only been widespread in the last 150 or 200 years in the West and never was widespread in the East. I mean, you read, Joseph was embalmed. No, wait, not Joseph. Israel. Anyway, one of the Old Testament patriarchs was, was embalmed. It's not, it's, not a, it's not something which is evil. And sometimes we need to do it for various reasons. Like we don't live together in a village anymore, right? So you may have people who live on the other side of the world who need to come here for your, for your funeral. If it's going to be five, six days, it doesn't matter if you're, if you're going to be in the cooler at the, at the, uh, at the funeral home. You're, you're, you're going to be embalmed. There's just no way you're, if you want an open casket. And it's okay. I, it's not something which is a, which is like a, a terrible sin or something like that. It's just not something that, that we've generally practiced, but it's acceptable when it's needed, I guess is the way that I'd say it. Um, if you are embalmed and you're buried here at St. Vladimir's, then you, you will be in a, uh, a, a complete uh, sarcophagus, like the, 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 the cement box on all sides. If you're not, we can do a completely green funeral where we, we put dividers in that would eventually um, biodegrade and you can be on the ground. So for some people that's important. This is one of those benefits of living in a place where there's a lot of Muslims because um, Muslims have to be buried with their face touching the dirt. So all of their things have an open bottom, so we can use those too. John. So this notion of uh, allowing the pathologists or the medical students uh, to have practice on your body, does that invalidate any of the uh, orthodox? Uh, so I would say that's an exception. So the question is, uh, what about giving your body to science, essentially? I mean, would they give it back when they were done? They don't. They give you ashes. <laughs> they give you ashes. And so, and I understand that. That's a legal thing on, the, on their end. Um, in the history of our parish, I only know of one time that that was seriously asked for, and and it was also allowed. The person had a had a uh, a disease which is not well known, but is but which is relatively widespread. Uh, they had uh, ALS, 
and they they very much wanted to donate their uh, brain to science to to help. Uh, and uh, the bishop thought that that was that was a reasonable request, and he blessed it. But I think it has to be something like that. Uh, Even yeah, further, we just Russian people. We don't understand what is this little bomb. In bomb. In, in, in bomb. What is it? I don't know the I don't know the word. <laughs> What's it? Mount Mount Zaleh. Ah, like a mummy. Well, not exactly like a mummy, but yes, to, they remove some of the bodily fluids and replace it with chemicals so that you don't decompose quickly. So this is out of our control. It's some, it's something that we don't have to do. We don't have. And there's no law that says you must do it. But if you want an open casket, it. You need to plan it very well if you will not be involved. Like it really needs to happen on the third day, probably. So if I have open casket, because everybody wants to look at me. Yeah? We want to kiss you. That's the yeah. yeah. And that means I have to be in. No, you don't have to be. But if you want to do it like a week after your after you die, then you probably would have to be involved. What is the difference? It, it, you it, will not kiss me. Or what? We will kiss you, you but <laughs> that but. So the, it slows down the process of decomposition. It's not a church thing. That's strictly the funeral home thing. So the church doesn't care. Uh, it doesn't. It doesn't promote it, but it doesn't refuse it. But that was, of course, not the tradition ever in the church until we came to the West. So and it's still not the tradition in many countries. Public Holland once. Just a second. That will help stop the decomposition. Right. There, there are certain things that are done to make but it slow down. Like I have a choice that I will select not open cast. You could have an open casket. casket. No, you could have an open casket, but it should be like on the third day, which is the, the standard in the church. So, but, but, so what is more important, to have an open casket or to be in public? Father <laughs> Collins is going to answer that question. <laughs> More so, the point, I guess, is in our society, the norm is involving. So if you don't want to be involved, you have to make, you have to take conscious steps to prevent that from happening. Either way, you would have an open casket because that's what we do. But if you're not getting involved, you're definitely having your funeral on the third day, whether you like it or not. Or sooner. Or sooner, uh, especially if it's in the middle of July. And mm -hmm. if it's, and if you're involved, you have a time, a longer timeline. That, Correct. That's basically it. It's mostly because we live so scattered and we don't families don't live together anymore. Right. And if you don't explicitly tell them you don't want to be involved, they're just going to do it. Right, they assume that that's what you want. Yeah, so we'll talk about uh did we talk about that the third day? I I thought I wrote more of this down. I must have talked about that on Curious Flat. So um generally the, the funeral is done on the third day. I, okay. Yes, sometimes, as Lena said, in Greece or in the other southern Orthodox countries in Africa, they might bury them on the day they die or the day after because they're not going to embalm them uh, and it's warm. So uh, we, we have to be flexible in that, in that regard. So it's not that we have to be embalmed, but if we don't want to be, then you really have to plan it. You really have to plan it well, and we all we need to know what's going on so we can get things going fast. Other questions? There's still a little bit more to cover. If you mean. Oh, okay. Well, I didn't want to interrupt too much. No, that's okay. Uh, well, my uh, my first question is, um, I'm Russian, and 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 i am russian 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 and i am
continuum in help. It's not just like everybody gets the Bugs Bunny pitchfork people and, and, and it, it's going to be different. But um, Metropolitan Eurytheos uh, Blockos wrote a really nice book about this, uh, which I just looked up the other day and now I forgot. It's something like Life After Death. I don't remember exactly, but it's, it's a really good book. And he explains that in the next life, because one of the attributes of God is that he's fair, right? God is fair. So everyone will get the exact same thing. We will, be, we will all be enlightened by the light of God. For those who pursued God in this life, they will interpret that light as warmth. For those who fled God in this life, they will interpret that light as fire. But it's the same thing. So we sort of have these very compartmentalized ideas of like, here is heaven, you know, cookies and milk and everything there. And here is hell with the devils in the, in the burning and the everything. It's, that's not the way that it's going to be. It, there may be some delineation between these spaces. It may not be the same space, but everybody gets the same reward. Everybody gets the same thing. Everyone is exposed to the light of God, which is what we're striving for, right? Transfiguration, right? This, this idea of being transfigured into the sons and daughters of God. But those who sought to be with God in this life, they receive that as warmth and comfort, and those who didn't receive it as burning. So, okay. does that make sense? Yeah, two more questions if I can. Mm -hmm. um, just to follow up on that, um, if, uh, if we do make it, um, I've, I've heard that people say that like we haven't like really reached theosis like completely, even when we're in heaven, like we're still working. Like working out our salvation, is that true? That seems to be the case. So the idea of being transformed, of being transfigured into the sons and daughters of God, that's what salvation is for an Orthodox Christian. It's not like you be a good boy and you get your reward. It's, it's not like that. We're not just trying to be good. Being good is baseline. We're seeking to be transfigured, to be transformed into the sons and daughters of God. And the saints imply, if they don't quite say it openly, but Vladika is pretty pretty uh, clear about this, that this is a process which begins in this life and continues in the next. So I think that's pretty interesting. We also have to understand that we're the creation and not the creator. And so some of these things that God allows us to know because it's good for our salvation, doesn't mean we'll be just like, oh yeah, I, I totally got that. I completely understand that and I'm good. It takes sometimes a little while to kind of understand these things and maybe it takes a whole lifetime. Okay. You want to say something, Father? Uh, it was just that brought to mind uh, St. Gregory of Nice, that's like Moses when he talks about Moses asking to see the face of God and God says that he can't be chosen his back instead and St. Gregory says that um, those those who are opposed to God see Him face to face, and their state their status is set. Whereas those who follow God are continuously behind Him and continuously striving to get closer and closer. But there will never be a point in which they made it because it's fine. Right. We can't. We don't become God in essence. Only the Holy Trinity is God in essence. But by grace, this process continues. So, to me, it's wonderful, and we really have to teach our children that being saved is not just like you decided that okay I'm going to follow Christ that's the first step or that you're good that's the second step but that's all that's building the foundation we would need to build on top of that foundation which is our transformation and transfiguration that's why we struggle in this life um, is to keep working in that direction so yes one more question uh, the last question is about funerals um, so I've seen the Serbs do um Unborn, unbaptized baby funerals. Do we do that, and why and why not? So, um, there isn't there is a service for a non-orthodox person a funeral. It exists, but it's it, it, unless with your bishop's blessing, it's to be done like in times of war or when there's no other like. You've got some, okay, you're in war, somebody dies on your side, that's a, a or even one of the enemy, um, and you need to care for that person because it's, it's, it's our obligation to care for the dead, right? This is one of the ways that Christianity spread in the early centuries. 
because there were two major pandemics in the first three centuries of Christianity. Both of those were hemorrhagic fever uh, pandemics. That means you get sick with this virus, you walk down the street, you fall on the ground, and you die from blood coming out of your eyes and your ears and every orifice of your body. It's a terrible, horrible death. There were two pagan emperors at that time, one in the east and one in the west, and they have a correspondence, some of which was, was preserved. And one is saying to the other one, it's clear that paganism will die. Because when our people die, our people run away from them. When our people die, the Christians care for our people. They don't just care for theirs, they care for ours. So that's a, I thought, I thought that was a very interesting thing, um, that we have some of that preserved, and they're predicting between each other, the East and Western emperors, that we, we're seeing the end, the beginning of the end of paganism. They probably didn't know how fast it would end, um, because of the way that the Christians treat the dead, both their own dead and our dead too. So did I answer your question, or did I just answer the question I wanted you to ask? Mm -hmm. So, so why don't, so, so I guess we... Oh, yeah, about non-Orthodox funerals. Yeah. So, um, in times of war, or when there's no pastor or Catholic priest around, or whatever, rabbi, will care for the dead, and there's a special, um, watch out for the trap door. What are you talking about? <laughs> um, we... We will care for the dead of others if there's no clergy to care for them. Okay. Uh, that's that's how we were taught in seminary. That's the exception. Now, occasionally, the bishop has blessed something like that, even when there was somebody available. It's very unusual. By far, the exception. By far. So, if a child dies, um, it's either a stillborn or dies before they're baptized then they're generally buried at the edge of the cemetery. Inside or outside? Usually right outside. There's a special area outside. Um, so, yeah. What, the, the fact that there was some service done for this, the child who died uh, was a miscarriage, I think. Um, that's an exception. And I'm sure that the priest got the blessing from his bishop to do that. Okay. Yeah. Good question. Okay. Let's move on. We're just about done. Have some good questions. And then I'll answer also Juan's question, because I see that I had imagined that I wrote it, and I didn't. So the key is to start early. Should, you should arrange your grave site now. Not tomorrow, not when you're old, but now. That's why we handed these out. So you can start to look and see how you can do this. Now, you're going to look at this, and finally you'll figure out that it's, it's not super cheap. It's some thousands, excuse me, of dollars. It's okay. You can do it over time. We're not going to charge you interest. You can pay small amounts, whatever. But you need to get your space set now because nobody is promised tomorrow. Um, you should arrange your estate the way you want it now and put it into a, a trust so no one can change it. You should arrange your funeral now and appoint a funeral proxy now if it's necessary because none of us are promised to make it home tonight. I told you I can list a lot of, I wrote here, I can list ad nauseum the number of times I've seen this go wrong because people did not take responsibility for their funeral, their estate, etc. In fact, I would say 99% of the time I've seen it gone wrong for this reason. Don't be part of the 99%, be part of the 1% by doing this right. Okay, most important things. Tell the priest when you are sick. Plan your funeral now. Plan your estate now. Put your estate into a trust. Arrange a funeral proxy if you're not 200% sure that your family will follow your wishes. Families are generally relieved to find out that everything is planned for their loved one when they die. Wouldn't it be a nice surprise for your family when you do the, this life, and you will, to realize that you've done everything for them? The answer is yes. That's not a rhetorical question. Don't be part of the 99% and mess that up. Do it right by planning ahead in such a way that you, your wishes will be fulfilled. Now, cremation. Why don't we practice cremation in the Orthodox Church? Because it's not a Christian practice and never has been. It's just, it's not a practice of the people of God. Also, the Jews did not practice this in the Old Testament. It's just never been something that we did. The only place that cremation is practiced in the Orthodox Church is in Japan. 
because it is the, um, that's the federal law. And the only person uh, that can abrogate that law is the emperor. They may have changed that now, I'm not sure. Um, but at least at one time, that was just the emperor. Uh, and so in uh, Japan, St. Nicholas of Japan, who died there, uh, was not cremated. Uh, the emperor uh, wrote an edict allowing for him to be buried uh, on the grounds of the church that he built in Tokyo, which is the highest point in the entire city. It's called Nikolaido, uh, and that's where he's also buried. And there is also a priest buried there too. It may be that uh, priests are not cremated, that's possible. But I know there's at least one priest buried there too, and I think it's the, the priest, the first priest that he ordained, uh, and that was the assassin who was sent to kill him. Um, so he, he convinced him that killing him was not the right thing to do, but rather to accept Christ, which he did, and eventually became the first Japanese-born priest. So I think then his name was Father Paul, and I think he's buried there beside him. Um, in any case, generally in Japan, if you're an Orthodox Christian, you go to the church, the funeral is done, and then you go to the crematorium. But otherwise, it's just not a practice which is accepted in the church, and I know it's starting to get acceptable in the Western church, I don't think that the Orthodox Church is gonna is gonna uh, buy into this. I just don't because, uh, first of all, it's not. It, sometimes the relics of saints are are incorrupt. That's actually we only find that out after a person is glorified as a saint. So it's not one of the things that's used to determine whether they're a saint, but. It's such a strong tradition, the idea of venerating relics and having relics of the saints. I can't imagine that the Orthodox Church would say, okay, no more relics forever. We'll just burn everybody up. I, I just don't see it happening. So I, I think that we're going to keep to that, uh, at least as far as I can tell, uh, and that we won't be allowing cremation. Yes, sir. So Protestants like to kind of say that, well, it says in the Bible, you know, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. So. It sure does, but it very strongly implies that the Lord is going to take care of that. If that was something that we were supposed to have done, surely the apostles and the ancient saints would have practiced that, or at least told us that, they, that we should do it. We have this really weird thing going on in, in our society, like, I lived, I live later than this other person, like... Uh, I don't know, Aristotle. So therefore, I'm smarter than, than him because I have more knowledge than, than Aristotle had. So this is the same kind of thing. Well, they never did this in the church until this generation, but we're so brilliant theologically now, we're going to decide to do that. It, it just, it's so not an orthodox thing. So you follow? Yes. So I, I read somewhere, I very bad at remembering, uh, that it was actually about distinction as goats and uh, lamb, you know, so the same thing, like you burned by God, or you are part of God. So. Well, that, that's one way to think about it. Sure, I, I, I think the real issue from the Orthodox point of view is it was only a pagan practice. It was never practiced by the people of God, uh, and therefore it's just not something that's on the on the uh, option list. Father Colin. So, in response to that, if a Protestant were ever to say that, ask them at what point in the scriptures is any of the saints described in the Old Testament burned? None. Every single saint in the Old Testament was buried, and it's only the pagans. And this is even something that's a noteworthy event in, in the Old Testament when they start burning the dead. Um, it mentions it. It's, it's the same thing with all of the practices we look at in the Old Testament. It says, it's crazy, God allowed that. It's like, well, no, he, he permitted it, but... Um, no, yeah, so I think it's important is, is everyone was there. That was the practice from the beginning throughout the world because, you know, it, it's not like the, that it was just the Jews. Everyone believed and then the people started following the pagans. And that's when they started to their death. Um, but everyone there. And, and it was in the Old Testament, everyone continued to bear. So. How about if you draw? Well, there is a, we've, we've done services without a body, even here at St. Vladimir's, um, and it, of course it happens that someone goes to sea and they don't return, you do the funeral without a body, it, it can happen, but that was not the, uh, the fathers were not foreseeing that we were going to have uh, cremation in our days, and therefore to use that service in that way. I wonder if, if you live in Japan and you can say, you know, bury me in the sea. 
Maybe it's possible. They might. You'd probably have to pay for it, but they have the they have the tradition of burial at sea because the Japanese Navy is based completely on the British Navy. That all of their practices are completely just like the American Navy, actually. Um, yeah. So we can. That's a different lecture, but an interesting one. Um, other questions about cremation or about anything that we talked about today? Did I answer your question, one? Okay, eager. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we are conscious right now, I think. Uh, we are kind of dependent of the body. But body, like for instance, I have guts. I can have never seen them. And I don't want them. But this is mine still. Somebody created heart, brain. Who we are? Probably we are kind of Isaiah. We are host, host. host yeah. of our spiritual life. This is who we are. And that creature, basically, it can be disconnected from, from our body. Basically, this is what's going on for the next life, not now our body. That's not true. So the soul, it's a, it's a thank you, Ray. The, the soul is immortal. It doesn't need the body to live, but the body needs the soul. And so if the soul, when the soul, death is the separation of the soul from the body. Plain and simple, but the soul doesn't die. This, there's no idea of the soul dying, sleeping, uh, going on vacation until Christ comes again. None of that. You'll find that all kinds of really interesting and crazy ideas uh, in about souls, even within the, the sort of broader, the great uh, Christianity, I would say. But the, the, the Orthodox Church has no concept uh, of that. The soul lives, and perhaps it lives more without the body than it ever lived with it in a more authentic way. Other questions? We will be, the, the, Igor mentioned it, the, the body is the temple of the soul, and a transfigured body will be, uh, the soul and the transfigured body will be rejoined at the second coming. Other questions? Jack's tapping his watch, which means I think we're done. So thank you, everyone, uh, for, for joining us. And let's sing the prayer after uh, our meal uh, to thank God for, for the meal. <clears throat> we thank thee, O Christ our God, that thou hast satisfied us with thine earthly gifts. He brought us out of thy heavenly kingdom. But as thou camest among thy disciples, O Savior, and gavest them peace, come to us and save us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, both now and ever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Father, bless us. Lagoslavim bog mila i pita i nas od svih bogatih torov svoji u blagoratu i čada veko dubijem, sik dan i nji presno i vove ki vekov. Amin.